Fifth Hour Radio Show. Stephen, let's go back to the very beginning. Before you ever had any kind of training in any martial art, what got you interested in visiting that first school, I guess, and to set you on the path that you were destined to follow? Well, you know, when I was a little tiny guy in the early 1950s, I remember seeing some kids uh, that I was going to school where uh, humiliated, actually. A uh, little kid would pick on the other, and uh, I didn't like that. You know, hey, I, that didn't look good. I wasn't necessarily targeted, but something was wrong. Something was wrong. I wanted to make sure that, hey, the good, the clean, the, the bright ones, could be protected. And, uh, I mean, isn't that funny? A little teeny kid like that. I didn't grow up around violence in my home. Uh, my dad wasn't a fighter. Nothing like that. There was just something in me as a little teeny kid that seemed to drive me to, to find some kind of a, a way to be strong when I needed to. So when did you, when did you first start? I mean, was it a, was it a school that got your interest? Was it movies? Oh, no, no movies back then. No movies at all, no TV, no magazines. Uh, kind of a miracle uh, that I even found out about martial arts. I mean, it was that long ago. Can you imagine? Such a thing as <laughs> no Ninja Turtles or no, no Karate Ninja Turtles, Kid. Huh? Or no, no remake of the Karate Kid a generation later. This is before all of that. And uh, But there was, a, there, there was a TV show I saw. Uh, old listeners might remember this Lassie TV show. You know, and there was this heroic dog and uh, out on the farm, and this little kid uh, uh, was the owner of this dog. And in that one episode, I must have been six years old when I saw this. There was a there was a exchange student in their little farm area from Japan. Now this would have been like ten years after World War Two, so mm-hmm. you know Japan was still kind of you know unsure and exotic and so forth, and some of the Bullies were picking on this little kid, and he had to use his martial arts to defend himself. Well, I saw this. I, this is incredible. That's what I'm looking for. Mm-hmm. That's what this little tiny kid can you know, defend himself. And then, at the end of the show, some of the adults that of these little bully kids that got beat up, you know, they come over to do something, set fire to the barn, and the dog comes out and makes noise, and this little kid ends up using his healing powers. He knows how to use herbal medicines. Can you imagine that in the Mm -hmm. early 1950s? Herbal medicines from Japan to heal uh, these people that had attacked him. I mean, that set the course for my whole life. I've got to find that. I've got to find that, and I've got to be that. So uh, uh, who would have guessed? Yeah, I mean... Lassie TV show. (laughs) How did you end up taking what I consider a huge step, you know, a giant step, in moving to Japan to train with, I guess, authentic ninja masters. Was it on a whim? I mean, did you know where to look or even who to look for? Oh, man, I wish I could say yes. <laughs> Maybe you look a lot smarter. Yeah, you know, when, uh, when I got to high school, a friend of mine, this was so 10 years after the last show, this is in the middle of the 1960s, this friend of mine gave me a James Bond novel. This is before there were James Bond movies here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, Oh, you got to read this. And in this novel, James Bond, the espionage uh, uh, agent, is sent to Japan on this secret mission, and he's trained there by these uh, characters called ninja, intelligence gatherer fighters, and they arrange for him to marry this beautiful Japanese girl from the seacoast of Kyushu Island so he can kind of fit in and uh, there he is on his majesty's uh, secret service oh man this is fabulous but here I was this boring little kid in Ohio you know how was mm-hmm. I gonna you know and it was just a James Bond novel that stuff couldn't be true huh? but I did find out about the ninja in that uh, novel still hadn't taken any martial art lessons you know couldn't find anybody that could teach any kind of martial art where I was living. You know, out in California, there were uh, judo and karate uh, by then and East Coast a little bit. But uh, I ended up at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. And by chance, there are these uh, Navy officers who had been in the Korean War, and they had this 
Korean karate group that they uh, allowed their Navy midshipmen to train in. Well, I wasn't in the Navy, but, oh, man, I, I did everything I could, and I talked to them into uh, allowing me to come in and train. And so that's where, at 17, I finally got my first actual martial arts lesson. So how did you get to Japan? I mean, I mean, did you just save up your money? I mean, was you did you work over there? I mean, how did, how did you find your way? How did you make your way once you got there? Well, I, I, I loved this karate that I was doing. I did that for several years. I graduated in 1971. And what am I going to do with my life? Uh, and I remembered, I remembered these ninja characters. And by then, I'd seen an article in Black Belt magazine talking about an actual teacher, this guy that was the 34th uh, generation headmaster of the Togakure Ninja Ryu, and that was what was referred to in this James Bond novel. And, you know, could this guy be for real? Um, later I found out that the author, Ian Fleming, the author of the James Bond novel, mm-hmm. had actually heard of this guy, and that's where he used the name Togakure in some of these training things. Uh, so it was legitimate. So oh, I wrote letters, and nobody would answer my letters. And I finally scraped together a little bit of money, and uh, I just couldn't stand it to think that yeah, that might be over there. And got on an airplane and went to Japan. And, uh, you know, I'd taken a few Japanese language lessons in school, but I couldn't read. I didn't even think about that. You know, I get to Japan, how am I going to look this guy up in the phone book? Or how am I even going to find his town? Oh, you know, and uh, I can only say a bunch of miracles happen. Miracles that I just happened to meet certain people. And if you put, if we were doing a movie of this and you put the, the actual story, I think people would walk out of the movie. It was just disgusting. That could, ne- that could never happen in real life. Uh, there are just miracles. And I found this tiny uh, hidden school where they still were teaching the old ways and uh, managed to talk my way in. This was uh, this was now 10 years after the James Bond novel. This was mid-1970s that I went over there. Um, and uh, just very lucky, very fortunate that they did accept me. Uh, I found work when I was over there. I did uh, uh, TV and... Uh, some movie character roles, you know, as a foreign guy over there. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, nobody would have seen any of these movies except for the, uh, there was a miniseries, Shogun, that uh, played here. I was in that movie, so people might have seen uh, mm-hmm. a couple oh, scenes yeah. with me in it. Yeah, so I was so fortunate because they paid me enormously well, you know, for a couple of days of work. And then the rest of the time I could train and travel around Japan looking for... Uh, castles and other things I needed to, uh, to learn about. Uh, so that's uh, not something that I can actually brag about thoroughly planning out before I went over. <laughs> you know, I, but everything worked out perfectly. Very lucky it. guy. Yeah. So you, 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 t- you spoke did. about being accepted. Uh, was being an American there difficult at all? I mean, any kind of hesitation on them to teach you perhaps traditional Japanese secrets? I mean, did you have to prove yourself in any way or... Or am I, like, totally off base with that? No, that's pretty accurate. So uh, now we're, like, a generation. This is mid-'70s, so it's, like, 20 years after World War II. And uh, most of the people I was I was in my 20s, most of the guys there were in their 20s. The headmaster uh, was approaching, uh, you know, he was in his mid-'40s, and he had just inherited his title from his old teacher, the old teacher, was an 1800s guy Mm -hmm. and uh you know maybe i was kind of fortunate because by then uh war was over um america came in and uh you know the japanese people were just amazed at how america rebuilt japan we Mm -hmm. gave them democracy we gave them education for all people we gave them uh private ownership of land people couldn't do that um so by then, uh, you know, American wasn't, you know, at least not in this training hall, wasn't as uh, as scary or negative a thing as if there had been a bunch of old guys, you know, maybe yeah. had uh, yeah, something like that. Uh, now, that's not to say that all the Japanese guys liked me. You know, some of them 
didn't think I should be there. And they told the head teacher, hey, what are you doing? You know, you're giving secrets away. And uh, he said, no, no, he, he's, he's got a role to play. Uh, and uh, uh, he's going to stay here. Now, here's a funny part of that story. Years later, I mean, years and years later, I met, I had met uh, Rumiko uh, and uh, married her. So like the James Bond novel, I'm training with the Togakure Ninja, and I meet this girl from the seacoast of Kyushu Island, and uh, uh, she's talking with some of my training friends, because she also began training, and they said, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. No, back in those days, uh, you know, Stephen was such a big guy compared to all the rest of us that uh, Headmaster wanted him to stay in the dojo so we could try out all our stuff and see if it would work on a big foreign guy. So, so I was a, I was a training dummy. Here yeah. I, here I'm thinking, how oh, how honored I am uh, to be accepted. And no, no, I was just I was a, a big training dummy for him. So uh, uh, maybe it's good I didn't know that at the time. So, so Stephen, man, I have to tell you, I've been a huge fan of martial arts since I was young. You know, a really young kid. I watched every ninja movie I could get my hands on. <laughs> you know, I had all the ninja oh. apparel, the, the weaponry I could afford to buy out of the magazines. So it's cool to be able to talk to you. And I guess the question I'm leading to is this. You had to have some kind of expectation before you got to Japan. Was it, was it everything you ever dreamed it would be while, while you were in Japan training? Well, you know, that's... Uh hard question to answer because I really did go over on a wild, crazy gamble. I mean, I had no no plans. I didn't even know whether I could find this guy. What if they didn't accept me? Or, you know, my dad, he he told me later, he says, oh, he says, wow, you're a really brave guy. He says, I would have been afraid if I went over there, they would have just broken my arm or shoulder and sent me home. <laughs> Man, I never thought about that. I never even thought of that. <laughs> and, uh, Were you injured so, while you were over there? Any kind of Not training that heavily. mishap? Yeah, just wear and tear injury, you know. Mm-hmm. But everybody got Japanese guys and me, uh, just wear and tear injuries that you're doing if you're punching and grappling and fighting with swords. And uh, But you know what I was expecting? Once I got there and I saw what this was and how different it was from all the martial arts that I'd known in the 1960s and the 1970s, I knew something was going on. I, I really did. I felt something is going on. I'm, um, this isn't a fluke. Um, I'm supposed to do something. I'm supposed to help the world with this. And uh, didn't know what it would look like yet, but I, I did feel there was some significance. This stuff couldn't have happened with all these crazy miracles and accidentally meeting these people and being in the right place at the right time. And uh, But I didn't say a lot about it out loud because it would have sounded you know, kind of presumptuous. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, but now, 30-some years later, when I look back and, you know, I got 20-some books out on this and, you know, a lot of people, even the young ones, you know, this is three generations away. I go yeah. to a martial arts convention, everybody's doing MMA and uh, uh, they may not remember all these old, tiny Japanese martial arts, but, you know, people still recognize me when I come in and uh, oh, of course. have good things to say, you know, so I think, yeah, there was something that was supposed to happen. Something was supposed to happen with that. So how long were you actually in Japan? And, and when you did decide to return, did you have your mind made up at that point? You were you are going to share what you had learned by, you know, starting a school or teaching? Well, I was there from for the late 70s, and then my, my visa to stay there ran out. And by then I was married, and uh, then we had some, uh, uh, we had two daughters in the early 80s, and all through the, 1980s, what we would do is I would go over on a couple months tourist visa in the fall and the spring with my wife and my daughters. They'd go down to Rumiko's family area and, you know, stay with her grandparents and cousins and Rumiko and I would go to train and we did that all through the 80s. So over about 15 years, you know, we were uh, in all those classes. And then the 90s, I girls were getting where I couldn't pull them out of school here in, uh, in Ohio. So we would go for the summer for some training. Um, but, uh, you know, I didn't actually start a school until uh, way into the late 1990s. I wanted to be free to be able to go over, to go wherever I needed to go. Um, 
I ended up in uh, Tibet in the mid '80s, and uh, coming out of there into India, uh, another strange coincidence story. Mm-hmm. I got connected with the Dalai Lama. And his oh yeah, family, yeah, yeah. And, uh, so I was traveling with him um, some part of each year when he was in North America as his uh, security escort. So I really couldn't run a school. Uh, I wrote books and I did seminars and encouraged other people to start training clubs and schools. Uh, but it wasn't until my uh, daughters got a lot older where I couldn't disappear for those kind of uh, things that we we started a school here in Ohio. And now, you know, a lot of my original students, they have schools. I'm kind of like the granddaddy, you know, yeah, and they've yeah. got schools and Tampa, Florida, and Los Angeles, and uh, Australia, and all over the place. So uh, each month I'll go to one of those schools for like a long weekend and teach some of the advanced methods to all the teachers there. So that's still a lot of uh, stimulating fun for me. Yeah, You know, that was one of the questions I was going to ask you was about the Dalai Lama and, and the relationship you had with him and, and how that all came about. How did you actually get hooked up with, with the Dalai Lama? Well, you know, that was another one of those wild, amazing things. I, I wish I had an intelligent answer, but it was just an amazing coincidence. Uh, I got an interview with him. Maybe they, I, you know, I told him I wrote books, so maybe they thought I could help, you know, publicize the plight of what Tibet was going through in the 80s and Believe it or not, my interview, I had an afternoon with him. I was wedged in between Rajiv Gandhi, the president of India, mm-hmm. and the Pope. You know, well, <laughs> I mean, here's that's this pretty crazy, good company. <laughs> pretty good company. <laughs> you know, here's this martial art guy from Ohio. And uh, turned out his, uh, his brother was the first one to escape Tibet when the Chinese came in. And he had become a professor, and he'd lived not far from my house. And... I got to know the family, and then uh, in those days, the U.S. government didn't do any kind of protection for him. Now we've got the State Department. They bring a huge team of you know 70 agents and uh, armored limousines and everything. But back then, they didn't do anything. And uh, so I happened to be there with him uh, in California when he found out he had won the Nobel Peace Prize, mm-hmm. and everything went crazy. You know, reporters and people went in to see this, and they really weren't prepared for any kind of security. So because of my background, I was able to just sort of jump in and kind of take over and help the political staff and family, and that's what started it. Then the next year, he came over, and uh, they called and asked if I'd be able to help him out again. And, uh, I did that, uh, you know, for... Uh, through the 90s, and then finally 1999, we were able to get the uh, State Department to come in and and, uh, do what they should have been doing all along. I don't know if this is a touchy subject or not, but did you ever have to step in and maybe defuse the situation while acting as the personal protection for the Dalai Lama? Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, what was challenging, I had a whole team of people that I had trained, and what's challenging with that is... um, you know, he's a, a holy man, so like a rock star, they want big heavies with uh, sunglasses, you know, bump somebody around, and then they get a lot of publicity, and that's cool, but you, you can't do that. So we had to develop these very subtle ways of escorting people out of there, get them, you know, get the wrong ones out of there. And, uh, and of course, we were constantly looking for a uh, death threat type of a thing. Um, so enormous amount of, uh, scanning and sensing who's in the crowd. We knew it wasn't going to be somebody dressed up in a Chinese mouse suit. It was, you know, that'd be too obvious. So it'd be somebody that would be sent, uh, maybe even look like a Tibetan. Uh, so, uh, we had to develop all of these, uh, protocols for getting any suspicious, uh, or actually, uh, dangerous people out of there. But, you know, that's what led me to developing the curriculum we teach now. Uh, a protection situation may be very different from winning a boxing match or an MMA fight. Um, oh, yeah. You know, oh, God, the laws, and there may be two or three of them. And uh, uh, so 
I Very unconventional of tactic, I'm sure. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you, know, you don't see that on movies a lot or, you know, a judo match on, at the Olympics or MMA on TV. So it, it's, it, it is very different. It involves a lot of the psychology. How can you read somebody real quick? And, of course, traveling with the Dalai Lama all those years, I got to sit in on all of his teaching. And, you know, I became pretty fascinated with this approach, Buddhists. Uh, understanding how the mind and emotions work to create reality for people. So I incorporated a lot of that in what we teach with this uh, kind of modernized version of the ninja martial art now. And, uh, yes, yeah, so I have to say, you know, all the stuff that I was doing for myself, uh, adventure, uh, you know, was, I was able then to turn around and build something that I think, you know, really shares that I can, I can give back to the world community in terms of how to be a you know a, a calmer uh, you know more authentic person through training and these mm -hmm. kind of strengths yeah yeah so so after all these years of you know you learning teaching writing books you know just living the life you've lived are you content or is there anything more you seek you know more knowledge anything of that nature what well, else I love that question. I love that. Um, you know, uh, I am content. This morning, my wife and I went down to this little tiny village near our where we live, and uh, you know, there are all these old restored antique houses, and we had a wonderful lunch together. It was just so easy and, and beautiful and wonderful, and, uh, you know, a few days from now, we'll be back on an airplane heading out to Colorado to teach an intensive weekend, so I get the I get the contented, enjoying my life part like any other 65-year-old guy would. Mm -hmm. But uh, at the same time, I really love what I do. You know, I yeah. can show up and uh, I've got something to share. And my, my own learning keeps going. So I'll be back in Japan in October. Uh, I've got a guy that's showing me some old secret sword techniques. and uh, Just really and, cool uh, stuff right there. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. Say, just I'm just such a fortunate guy in terms of being able to live my uh, live my childhood fantasy all the way into granddadhood here. Yeah, you know, Mister Hayes, I consider you to be a very wise man, and this is a question I wouldn't ask just anyone. Being a Buddhist priest, and I have to be honest, you know, I'm not too familiar with Buddhism, but in all your travels, your adventures, your studies, at this point. What what do you think the purpose of our life, the human race, is? Well, you know, I think the you know if we were going to call it a purpose, why are we here? What you know, it would be to you know make the most of this experience. And there are two ways that that we do that. One is never quitting the search for more truth. What What's the nature of reality? I mean, what are we really dealing with? And we're little, teeny, and we grow into teen years. We learn so much. Oh, man, I learned so much. And then from teens into the working world, we learn so much. And then a lot of folks kind of stop at that point. But there's just so much more that we need to understand about who we are. And the second part of the formula is we got to try it out. And so in, in the, the Buddhist approach, that's called compassionate action. We go out into the world and, you know, experience, try and help other folks to be a little more at peace, at the same time a little more alive, focus on the things that are really important, and, you know, try to not let the not-so-important but urgent and dirty things bring us down. Uh, you know, I'm kind of concerned when I look at some of the media today. You know, I think people are being played. They're yeah. always getting this horrible bad news and trying to get people to argue with each other you know neighbors arguing oh well, i'm a right winger oh, i'm a left winger oh you know i'm all of this stuff with uh social media even so called social but you know a lot of times it's anti-social and you know it's a trick to sell more stuff and so you know if people can understand hey we only got a limited number of days on the planet here you know how can i make the most of it and you know, to enjoy it and help others to enjoy, touch a few hearts, learn some good lessons along the way. I think 
that's what I would say, you know, for a quick discussion anyway. Mm-hmm. We, we might call the, the purpose of life the authentic and uh, fully engaged in life. I like to say we need to keep our imagination. You know, like you said, when, wow. we, were, when we were a kid. Wow. You know yes, I mean? yes. We lose that as yeah. we get older. Yeah, but I mean, do you find in do you find in your work with with you know with with radio, you get to talk to so many people. I mean, isn't that just amazingly stimulating for you? Oh man, I love it. There's nothing more in this. Uh, well, besides my family and stuff like that, of course. But I just love what I do, and I I keep working harder at it. It's something that I I believe, like yourself, I'll continue to do this for the rest of my life, or uh, at least I hope so. You know. Uh, I love it. Yeah, sounds like a great life you yeah. get to live there. Uh huh. So, Stephen, before we get off here, man, we spoke of social media and website. How about yours? Where can people go and learn more information about you and uh, your schools? You can get, you know, buy your books and stuff like that. Well, um, if people just write my name, S T E P H E N K H A Y E S, just write Stephen K Hayes like it's one giant word without any gaps or just Stephen K Hayes dot com. Uh, That'll take people to uh, where they can find books, find their schools. In fact, we got a new service now where I'm taking a lot of these little short movies, very, very short, uh, where people can actually learn some of these techniques uh, online there. But that uh, S-T-E-P-H-E-N-K-H-A-Y-E-S dot com, that's kind of the gateway. That's the portal to uh, all the stuff there. Well, man, thank you so much for taking time out. This has been a one of the coolest shows I've ever done. Oh, well, I appreciate you inviting me. Yeah, man. Yeah, I've been a fan you. of yours, like I said, man, since I was a kid. And uh, you're right up there near the top of the list, if not the top. Because, I mean, I have read so much of your stuff. I just wish I could someday meet you in person. Let's see if we can set that up. Let's yeah. see if we can set that up, Rob. All right. Okay. Hey, thank you so much. Great talking with you. Yeah, same here. All right. Have a good one, man. Radio Show.